Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is June 24th, 2016. And here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, it's Independence Day in the UK as a stunning populist revolt breaks the UN chain of the political establishment. Brexit, the dawn of a populist uprising. But don't expect the elite to take this lying down. Then, Bernie Sanders says he will vote for Hillary Clinton. Are you going to vote for Hillary Clinton in November? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, the issue right here is uh, I'm going to do everything I can to defeat Donald Trump. And why does the IRS need AR-15s? Jeff Duncan says he saw IRS special agents using semi-automatic rifles at a gun range. Now he wants answers to why the agency needs that type of firepower. Hmm. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Brexit represents nothing less than a stunning populist revolt and a complete rejection of the political establishment. After months of endless fear-mongering and propaganda, after months of trying to shame us into voting remain, politicians, celebrities, economists, bankers, you all failed spectacularly. It's a victory for ordinary people, decent people. It's a victory against the big merchant banks, against the big businesses and against big politics. And I'm proud of everybody that had the courage in the face of all the threats, everything they were told, they had the guts to stand up and do the right thing. Brexit is also a devastating example of how the deceitful media is losing its power to control the narrative. But don't expect the elite to take this lying down. Here's what the political class will do in response. They'll blame the next ISIS terror attack in Europe on the instability caused by Brexit. As always, it will have nothing whatsoever to do with Islam. They'll blame the popping of the financial bubble that's been totally inevitable for years anyway on Brexit. They'll then try to offer Britain a new deal to stay in the EU, or they'll just make us vote again in another referendum until they get the result they want, like they did in France, Ireland and the Netherlands. These people are snakes. Don't think the battle is won, it's only just beginning, because the political class is backed up by an army of authoritarian, anti-democratic, leftist morons thousands of whom have already signed a petition to hold another referendum. Sky News and the BBC are also floating this second referendum crap. Listen up, lefties. I know you're upset that months of virtue signalling about how progressive you are for voting for Remain on Facebook has turned out to be a total waste of time. But you lost. Get over it. Maybe you'll now finally realise that calling people racist or Nazis over and over again isn't an argument. It doesn't work anymore. I mean, look at some of the reaction. The bedwetting and the toy throwing from leftists today is delectable. Brexit is an incredibly sad victory for racists and bigots and much that is vile in the world. Oh look, another arrogant, sneering, loathsome elitist who is on the wrong side of history. Just like Obama and Hillary are on the wrong side of history. Today is like waking up to find out the Nazis won the Second World War. Yeah, that's not an overreaction at all, is it? I'm scared. Jokes aside, I'm actually scared. Today an older generation has voted to ruin the future for the younger generation. I'm scared! Oh, you mean the same older generation whose fathers fought and died to make sure you wouldn't be ruled from Germany in the first place. The fact all the generations have reaped the benefits and pulled the EU from my generation? Furious! My generation wanted in. It's our time. Right, because youth unemployment in EU countries is really low, isn't it? Good to see we'll be staying in the EU. If I wake up to Nigel Farage's smiling face, I'll kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely scared for the future? I know, right? What are we gonna do with all this new sovereignty and money? It's terrifying! But Brexit is about more than just getting out of the EU. It's about reclaiming some genuine sense of patriotism after decades of being told that we're a country whose glory days are long gone. A country that should constantly apologise for its colonial history. Constantly being derided as small-minded little Englanders. Constantly being lectured that we're racist merely for expressing concern about mass immigration. This is a rejection of the politics of fear, the politics of grief. This is a new morning for Great Britain. This is the dawn of a populist uprising. This is a catalyst for 
the rest of Europe to throw off the shackles of the EU. Let's not allow the political class and the authoritarian left to hijack what we've all worked so hard to achieve. Brexit is a crushing victory for the people against the establishment. Get used to it. There are many more to come. That was a fantastic report from Paul Joseph Watson. Now, you've heard what the crew has to say about this matter with the Brexit. And when it comes to politics, especially things that go on in other countries, I'm interested to hear opposing points of view because I'm always open to the fact that there may be something that I didn't take into account or maybe I'm looking at through an American glass, an American type of system, and maybe those views don't exactly match up with the people who live there on the ground. So I went to um, the interwebs and I found this article talking about British celebrities and pop culture icons reacting to the Brexit because, you know, celebrities just love to give their opinions on things uh, if they think it will get them some publicity. Let's start with J.K. Rowling. She said, Scotland will seek independence now. Cameron's legacy will be breaking up two unions. Neither needed to happen. Now, once again, I don't live there. I don't know the sentiments of all the people there. But just looking at this uh, concern about Scotland seeking independence, I don't know what's wrong with seeking independence because we have it here in this country. We celebrate every July 4th. So maybe she's looking at this at a different angle than I am, but just the fact that somebody may seek independence doesn't really bother me that much at all. We also have Hugh Laurie. He is Dr. House. He says the first hairline crack in the plasterwork. England fans will be paying 25 quid for a bottle of beer by Monday. Now, to this, uh, Leanne went out earlier today and she shot a man on the street and she was talking to some of the people and they said that uh, their currency has uh, deflated, I guess, is the proper terminology. And now their dollar or their euro, whatever, is worth less now than it was before. So uh, we see this continuing. And also, I was watching mainstream uh, just a few minutes ago. They have the big stock market with the big red arrow going down. Was it 600 or so points? And it's bringing people to question, is this just a temporary growing pain? Is this something that's going to persist going on into the future? But many people, uh, including uh, financial analysts that we've had on this show, say that it's pretty much uh, the bankers, people in charge, trying to scare people into rethinking the action that happened here today. But like I said, only time will tell. And there's another interesting one from MKO. I'm not exactly sure who that is, but they made it on USA Today. It says, Britain, don't play yourselves. You aren't the Beyonce of the EU. Your solo career is very uncertain, basically saying that uh, you don't have what it takes. <laughs> you know, like Beyonce was in Destiny's Child, you don't have what it takes to make it solo. So there's a lot of different opinions out there. I even made a rare uh, Twitter post. We had this conversation a couple days ago. I think it was me, Biggs, and uh, I think Marcos is back there running the board. And we were talking about how I don't post on Twitter all that much. And then Biggs told a bunch of his followers to follow me. And then I got a bunch of Biggs followers. So thank you, Rambo Biggs followers. Uh, but I sent out this tweet today. And I really just wanted to get a feeling for what people thought about the Brexit. And I said, good, bad, indifferent. You know, my post wasn't leaning one way or the other. And I guess I should have been a little more specific because I got a lot of Americans that responded. And I know they were Americans because they said that in their post. But for the few people who were in the EU, they were for it. Granted, you know, I have a lot of InfoWars followers and they have those type of uh, viewpoints. But it's not all the type of opinions that I just read here is the point I'm trying to make to you. But we'll definitely be covering this in the coming weeks and months. Now, let's talk about something else as we talk about diversity and things going on overseas, because we oftentimes look at it through the American glass. But what do people in other countries think? You think of the bathroom bills that are going on here, uh, boycotts going on at Target, all those things going around. And when you talk about what you should call somebody, it's always that tricky thing because there's always the politically correct terms, the preferred terms. I'll give you an example. We'll talk about the LGBT thing with this in just one second. But I was at, I think, Comic-Con of all places. I was talking to this guy, he's from uh, the UK, and we were having this conversation and he was like, no, you're supposed to address me as sir. He said it politely, but he was correcting me. He's like, you're supposed to address me as sir. And not sir as in the polite way, but like he's an actual sir going back to lineage. I'm not exactly sure what that is in their standards, but he was a sir. And I was like, bro, there is no way I was supposed to know that by looking and talking to, talking to you that you were a sir. But it's these type of politically correct things that they expect you to know. And now a uh, German MP is trolling diversity by addressing 60 different genders before he started his speech. Meine Damen und Herren, sehr geehrte Schwule, sehr geehrte Lesben, sehr geehrte Androgyne, sehr geehrte Bigender, Gendervariable, Genderqueer, 
Intersexuelle, weder noch Geschlechter, Geschlechtslose, Nicht-Binäre, Pangender und Pangeschlechtliche, Transmenschen, Intersternmännliche. Ach Gott, ich kann dir eine Zwischenfrage. Sie, ich bin ja noch nicht mit der Begrüßung fertig, Herr Präsident. Entschuldigung. And it begs the question, what are you supposed to call somebody? Can you say uh, mother and father anymore? Some places don't want you to do that. That's not inclusive enough. You can't say, excuse me, sir, that's not inclusive enough. Excuse me, miss, you may offend somebody. Uh, and, and it's really no shortage of this going on. I remember that piece uh, <laughs> Vedandi did a while back. He was talking to the Satanist, and he was talking to a uh, man in drag, I guess is the most polite way I could say it. And he was like, hey, hey excuse me. And she was like, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a lady. <laughs> and it's just so sorry. I was thinking, like, how are you supposed to know? Is it a long-haired guy or is it a lady? Like, how do they self-identify? There's no way to really know. So I, I think it is quite funny this guy decided to uh, call him out on that. Now, coming back here to some domestic news, you guys know we've done a lot of reports going along the border and talking about illegal immigration. And I had this conversation or I have these recurring conversations with people. And they say that no person is illegal. I'm like, bro, I'm not saying that you're an illegal human being, that you don't have a right to exist. I'm saying that there's a legal way to enter the country. Example, uh, I recently traveled outside the country, off the continent, as a matter of fact. And when I got to my destination, even though I had my documents, I had my passport and my visa, I had my um, back checked by TSA or whatever the foreign equivalent was, pat downs the whole nine. With all that said, had I walked out of that airport without checking into customs, I would have committed a crime and thus committed, here comes that trigger word, a illegal action, illegal activity. That's what it was. And same thing if you go out of your way to avoid a border checkpoint. You got a nice pay the road going up to the border checkpoint, but you decide to walk through the bush, you know, getting attacked, you know, by rattlesnakes and stuff. You're going out of your way to avoid that checkpoint. So with this in mind, Did you go through the, the checkpoint, yes or no? Did you go through customs, yes or no? If you answered no to either one of those questions, you entered the country illegally. It has nothing to do with race, religion, why you're there, how long you're staying, where you're going, anything else like that. Did you come into the country legally? And now we see this story. U.S. soldiers arrested in alleged illegal immigration smuggling ring. It says, U.S. authorities are investigating an illegal immigration smuggling operation allegedly run by active duty military soldiers out of Fort Bliss, and that's in El Paso. And Fort Bliss is the El Paso Intelligence Center, EPIC, that's quite the EPIC acronym, a federal tactical operations intelligence center. We are aware that two Fort Bliss soldiers have been arrested, a spokesman said. We can, we can confirm that they are both assigned to the 377 Transportation Company here. However, this is an ongoing investigation and we cannot comment further. And it says that the soldiers were paid uh, $1,000 each for a successful smuggling trip. They would have been paid $1,500 for a June 18th run, but they were busted by the Border Patrol. And this is always a thing, and I know we gave the Border Patrol a lot of heat, and there are things the Border Patrol does that I don't like, like when they have the checkpoint, you know, 100 miles from, uh, from the border, and they're saying, are you an American citizen? I'm like, why are you asking me these questions? Like, well, we're doing immigration. I'm like, am I immigrating someplace? I'm going towards the United States, not Mexico. Why are you asking me these questions? So I don't like stuff like that. But by and large, I think the Border Patrol does have their hands tied behind their back because they're told a bunch of stuff that they can or cannot do. Um, we've seen the reports, not just our reports, you go down to South Texas and uh, Falfurious, those areas like that. They have the local news going out to private land. And uh, she's standing there with the guy and the, and the people are coming over the border. And she said, the reporter, this, her words, it's like they're waiting for a bus. It's like they're at a bus stop just waiting for the Border Patrol to come and pick them up and you know, take them to the station. And then eventually it'll get them the tickets to wherever they have to go. We brought you those reports. Um, but with this, uh, I do like to see the Border Patrol doing what they can to stop the flow of uh, illegal immigration. Like I said, I have no issue with people who come here illegally, but there is a legal way in which to do that. Now, talking about... Uh, illegal activity, violations of your free speech. We see this all over the country, whether it's in schools or city council meetings or whatever else. Uh, they always want to stem your freedom of speech, going as far to even arrest guys for talking at city council meetings. It is uh, completely ridiculous. But now the city of Cleveland is backtracking a earlier action that they put out. And originally, they were saying that they were not going to allow pro-Donald Trump groups or, to be fair, anti-Donald Trump groups either to come out and protest him or protest for him at the Cleveland conventions, and now they're backing off of that. A U.S. district judge agreed with pro-Trump organizations 
represented by the ACLU, which sued Cleveland to overturn the rules governing protests during the July 18th through 21st convention. And they also go on to document how uh, Black Lives Matter had uh, similar things they had to overcome. And basically, think about this. I, I can understand to an extent why Cleveland would do this. I don't agree with it, but I can understand they say they don't want these groups to clash. But they're putting the anti-Trump people and the pro-Trump people in a very narrow timeline to where they have 30-minute increments. And if they have to move one group out and get one group in, you think they're going to have some type of conflict with that? Yeah, of course they are. So uh, it's a very bad decision, but I'm glad to see that they have overturned that. Because regardless of what you think about these political people, it doesn't matter if you like Trump or Hillary or Bernie or uh, Gary Johnson or none of them. These guys have their right to assemble peaceably. Uh, if their protesters come out there, start lighting stuff on fire, yeah, they get arrested. But the individuals themselves have the right to do uh, their political speech peacefully. And finally, tonight, uh, we saw Trump come out a couple days ago, and he says, you know, we need a plan to get Bernie supporters on our side so we can trump Hillary. And now Bernie's is, Bernie is saying he's probably going to back Mrs. Clinton. I'm sure he's not exactly happy about that. But he said, in all likelihood, it will be Hillary Clinton when he was asked who he would support. He says, my job right now as a candidate is to fight to make sure that the Democratic Party is not only the most progressive platform in the history of the Democratic Party, but that the platform is actually implemented by elected officials. And there's been a lot of uh, questionable activity, especially when it comes to Bernie Sanders. Maybe he was getting the raw deal, but it seems like he's going to toe that party line regardless. Well, that's it for this segment. We'll be back right after this with more special reports. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew, sitting in our brand new revamped studio over here where the original Nightly News used to take place. My, now, my next guest joining me, you may have seen him, uh, if you watched our Bilderberg coverage, uh, sticking his mic in the face of many globalists as they were trying to walk around and enjoy their day in Dresden, Germany. His name's Tillman Knechtel, and we're going to get his opinion on what happened yesterday in Germany at the shooting in Wernheim, and also talk about what's going on with Brexit. What? Because as you know, Germany and Britain were basically the two pillars holding up the EU, and now that they have voted to leave, what is going to be the future of the European Union? Tillman, how's it going today? Oh, very good. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. So what has been the reaction in Germany to uh, Britain voting to leave the EU? Well, we have reactions now from the Minister of the Economy who said, like, um, now the threat of war is rising in Germany. Like, they really bring this now into the discussion, like, there's going to be new war. So they always say this. They held this, this threat up for, like, 10 years. They said, oh, no, if there's, like, smaller states they will all go to war with each other and um, because they wanted obviously to centralize um, the European Union and making this big super state. So there's obviously no danger from small states attacking other countries. I mean, when did you see Monaco attack somebody? And when did you see Switzerland attack somebody? So this is obviously just fear mongering. And we had the um, German Green Party member, Rebecca Harms, she said she was about to cry because she will miss the British Parliament members. And she called the British Parliament members and they were actually crying. And yeah, I would also be crying if I get paid like 100,000 a month for basically doing nothing. So yeah, they create all <laughs> exactly. this panic and say, you know, the bureaucratic effort is now so high to get out of this. But obviously it was the EU that implemented all these laws to England and Britain. So it's obviously, obviously the, it's the EU's fault that, that they have all these laws and they have now this bureaucratic effort to get out of there. And now they blame it on the Brexit voters that they made it so difficult to get out of there. But if, if they hadn't installed it in the first place, all these laws and all these EU regulations, there, there would be no problem with it. So it's obviously the EU's fault. So it's really ridiculous and it's like, all over the world, I mean, mainstream media is bought and paid for by the EU, so they obviously report negatively about the vote now. Yeah, they're taking the uh, initial reports of like gold going up and the pound going down and uh, stocks going down in some areas and just saying, oh, this is, this is it, this is Armageddon is happening, this is it, people voted to uh, essentially to break up the EU with, with Britain leaving. But I think that's 
all a bunch of hot air. They said the same thing in Iceland when they voted to uh, basically go after the bankers and make the bankers accountable for destroying their economy. And what happened? Within six months, they had turned their economy around. They were back in the surplus. They put bankers in jail. And now they're one of the most more uh, one of the more prosperous countries in the European area. And there's no, nobody saying that Europeans can't have trade and culture and and work together on things. But when you create a dictatorial government inside with control over all these nations, what do you expect is going to happen? Eventually, people are going to get angry and and decide to. Uh, decide to leave. Now let's get to that German uh, shooting that took place in Wernheim, which is uh, just uh, in the region of Frankfurt, Germany. A, a masked man went into a theater. Uh, I guess he started opening fire, but nobody was killed except for the gunman. Now, Tillman, what have you learned uh, just doing your research in the last day or so on this event? Yeah, I mean, I have no 100% proof, but this looked highly suspicious to me because in Germany, we have a long histories of these lone gunmen killing people. And then being dead, we had like 2003, a school shooting. Robert Steinhäuser shoot 16 people, people, including himself. And then more than 40 witnesses speak of two gunmen. But the police doesn't investigate and also the media doesn't report. Then we have Winnenden shooting 2009, also a school shooting. The killer is dead, kills himself and kills 15 people. And there's a lot of contradiction in the, in the official version. Of course, witnesses speak of another gunman, but the killer is dead again. Then we have a shooting in Lorach. Killer, it's a woman, she kills three people, gets shot by the police. It's a lot of contradictions, no motive, no motive for the killer. The media doesn't report about it. And the killer is dead again. Then we have the National Socialist Underground that was a so-called Nazi terrorist organization. They, they were killed and they said they killed themselves when they saw the police arriving, which made no sense. And then it came out there was a German intelligence service member close to the attacks where these national underground killers were. So in, in six of the nine murders, there was an agent for the German intelligence. So all these contradictions and in the end, the killer is always dead. So we have the same here, which is at least sus suspicious. And this is, it is, of course, an indication so I did my research today and I called the cinema, I called the police and I called the office of the district attorney and I called the Bild Zeitung, which is the biggest newspaper in Germany. So no one really answered me um, except of the office of the district attorney, but they didn't really want to answer my questions. Um, so I asked them about some events that weren't super suspicious, but at least noticeable. But they always said, no, we can't answer that and we can't answer that. But I will guess I read you my questions, with I, which I had, because there were a lot of things that seemed at least noticeable. So I ask, um, why did it take three hours to the first emergency call from the cinema ma manager at 2.41 until 6? It took three hours till the police declared the area safe again. So that reminded me of Orlando. Like, why does it take three hours? I mean, where there's some negotiation negotiations with the hostage and uh, with the hostage taker. What happened in these three hours? Because obviously the police needs to be quick if it's like a kidnapping. They need to be as quick as possible. Then I was interested. Um, how did they localize the shooter in the cinema? So did they maybe see him through a window? And if so, shouldn't they have seen that he only has alarm weapons, which came out now? So it was just a question. I, I didn't say, oh, this, this has to be like that. By him. If they saw him before, they should have maybe seen that he has alarm weapons. So then, very important question I asked, and there was a report of the biggest German newspaper called the Bild Zeitung at 4.30, which included an interview with a witness who said that the kidnapper spoke broken German. And now the office of the district attorney says that it was a 19-year-old German from Mannheim and they say he was born in Germany and he's half Italian. So if he's born in Germany, I mean, the chance is there if he's half Italian. But um, it's more sure that he speaks perfect German. And why is he speaking broken German? And they never investigated that again. There was a witness who said he spoke broken German. Then there was another um, witness who said... Um, I had to close the door for the kidnapper and he was aiming a gun at my head. And then the kidnapper, the kidnapper told him to go up the elevator. So it's weird that the kidnapper says to somebody, 
um, leave me alone, go up the elevator, because obviously the, the hostage could flee and, I don't know, run away through security doors from the higher floor. So this sounds very weird for a kidnapper. And also what kind of kidnapper is that? There were no uh, negotiations. He had no real, no real gun, just an, uh, an alarm gun with tear gas. So where are the negotiations and, and, and what, what was his purpose? And then he shot the alarm gun and hurt 25 people with it. And I had the question that I also didn't want to answer. Did he have something on that protected him from the pepper spray, from the tear gas um, in the alarm gun? So also no answers there. And of course, the most important question, he only had an alarm gun. So was it really necessary to kill him? Of course, I mean, there's a lot of panic, um, but I mean, there, there are like dozens of, of policemen walking in there. They are protected from head to toe. So, I mean, if there is a shot fired, they will immediately see that it's, that it's just an alarm gun. And it's, a, it's one guy against, I don't know, 20 people. And, you know, and even if they shot them, the chances are very low that they kill him immediately. So was this really necessary? Of course, these were just questions I asked. And obviously, you know, they just gave out the official story and they didn't want to answer me. So, yeah, that was the most important question. But the story is still to unfold. So we get more information about this. So. That's right, Tillman. And other news outlets are reporting that he had harmless grenades. He had replica weapons. So this story really doesn't add up. We're out of time now, but rest assured, I know you're going to be on the case. If anything else crops up, you're going to let us know. And we'll be right back after this short announcement from InfoWarsLife.com. This is Rob Drew reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News. This is going to be a day like July 4th. Remember, that was not when we won the Revolutionary War. That was not when we won our independence. That was when we declared our independence, declared the right of self-government, declared that we have inalienable rights, that we create these governments to secure, that a just government governs uh, to fulfill these rights. And when they are destructive of those rights, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute new forms of government. And that's what we're seeing happening now, the very beginning of that happening in Britain. I never thought it would happen. I never thought it would happen. I thought it was going to be rigged. And of course, Paul Joseph Watson did as well. I know we were, I was watching his tweets and the things he was putting up in articles. I was tweeting the same stuff. It's like, okay, they're ahead right now. And say, no, now they've got Remain ahead. They're going to rig this election. It must have been a massive landslide for them to only win it by, for them to win it by four points. Okay. Uh, that was a solid win. That was a solid win. They had 70 some odd percent of the people turn out to vote and Watson is going to be here and give us uh, some more details on that but put that in perspective we only have about 50 percent of the people vote in American elections so that was a huge huge turnout now as uh, the headlines look uh, one article that's really good this was the day the British people defied their jailers that's a telegraph uh, headline another one Brexit, the world's most complex divorce begins. And we're going to talk about all this stuff. But as I was looking at this, as I was celebrating this pushback against globalism, all I could think about was the British are leaving. The British are leaving. That means I'm single again. Oh, yeah. the heck? Yeah, baby, it's Brexit. <laughs> I had to get in the car and go for a ride with my wife last night, like one o'clock. It was just too exciting. We celebrate the 4th of July as a reminder of earning our independence from a tyrannical and oppressive government. Just a reminder to the Obama administration, there's plenty of room on the calendar for another holiday. It is Independence Day for Britain, as Boris Johnson said. I was looking at the Telegraph's uh, Tim Stanley. He's, his headline is, this is the day the British people defy, uh, defied their jailers. He said, uh, the people defied the experts, and they went with their conscience. He said, labor voters, most of all the Northeast, rebelled against a century of labor leadership. He says, I'm astonished, staggered, humbled. I should never have lost faith in my countrymen, those bold, brave, beautiful British voters. Good for you. You're leading the way in freedom. 
And you know, it was Winston Churchill who said in the, the history of the English speaking people, now we've written a new chapter, by the way. This is going to be a new chapter. This is going to uh, continue in America. We're going to talk to Roger Stone about that. But this is a new chapter. And he said, when America got its independence from Britain, it was a liberating thing for Britain as well. It unleashed freedom in Britain. It gave power to the people, to the parliament in Britain. And we're going to see this happening as the EU unravels. And you're going to see true multiculturalism. You're going to see the energy and the culture of the European people, which has been repressed and dumbed down, turned into this kind of politically correct gray mass, uh, a lobotomized uh, population who has been indoctrinated and controlled by a central government. You're going to see that explode and creativity and diversity, true creativity, true diversity. So let's go to uh, Roger Stone. Of course, Roger Stone has worked for many pro-American political parties in Eastern Europe. And I want to talk to him about that, but we're going to talk about a victory, first of all, that has just happened in regards to our presidential election here. Welcome, Roger. David, great to be with you. Did you see this coming? I got to ask you, did, did you really see this coming? Because I didn't. I thought the people were with it, but I thought they were going to rig the election. It must have been a total landslide for them to be able to win by 4%. I guess they figured they just couldn't swamp uh, the votes that were coming in from the countryside by rigging it and uh, the places that they control. <laughs> yeah, globalism has taken two enormous hits this year. First, the rise of Donald J. Trump, uh, and now the Brexit vote. Uh, yes. Globalism is done, uh, and the globalists are increasingly panicky uh, about the prospects uh, for the road ahead. I think this portends very good things about the American election. Uh, and um, uh, I am uh, very pleased with the developments in the Trump campaign. I believe they can now strategically get back on track, get back on offense, uh, because when you're not on offense, you're losing votes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, when I looked at this, Roger, we saw this division uh, in the UK over Brexit. You had the labor leadership really versus the labor voters. The labor voters had really gotten the shaft with globalism. And yet the labor leaders, uh, the labor union leaders, as well as the labor party leaders were supporting uh, staying in this globalism that had cost their voters their jobs. And then we saw the Tory leadership divided as well. Here in America, we've got the Democrat leadership, like Hillary Clinton, who was pushing, say, keep this together. And uh, yet it's their voters, their blue collar voters who are being hurt by this, just like we saw in England. And then we've got the GOP establishment. And the only person on the other side of that is Donald Trump. But it's big enough that he can stand there with the blue collar voters, I think, and with the Republican voters who understand what's going on. The people that uh, Bilderberg was so concerned about, they called the precariat. I think uh, they should be very concerned about that precariat. I think they should be very concerned about this, uh, the people understanding how globalism has really screwed them over. Yeah, I think it's a very analogous situation. I mean, ironically, it is the Democratic Party and the Clintons who brought us NAFTA. Remember what it was that uh, Ross Perot said about NAFTA? He said that that sucking sound you hear of the jobs leaving America. Yeah. Of course, he turned out to be exactly right. Once again, the leadership of the Democratic Party uh, and some in the union movement uh, supporting uh, NAFTA, now I think a great recognition, particularly among the Bernie Sanders voters, that these large globalist trade deals, whether it's NAFTA or TPP, TPA, um, they're leaving the American economy behind. Uh, so um, it, it is a precursor. I really believe at the end of the day, Trump will be able to get almost a third of the Sanders voters, not his hard left voters, but those uh, labor oriented voters who both oppose the Iraq war uh, and oppose these globalist trade deals. And who also opposed the establishment essentially controlling them, the corrupt establishment, because that was also a big part of it as well. Uh, people didn't like uh, what was happening in Brussels, and people don't like what the establishment of both parties are doing to them. And that's a reaction that we see with the Sanders voters as well as with the Trump voters. So I agree with you. I think he's got a very strong case uh, to make to both of them. The American people now aren't buying it. In other words, that's I right. think voter dissatisfaction and voter suspicion has now spread beyond the institutions of government uh, and the Congress and the political system to now include big media. 
In other words, the voters know that CNN is in bed with the political establishment. Uh, they know that CNN uh, is, uh, is only going to publicize information beneficial to the Clintons. That's why we sometimes jokingly call it the Clinton News Network. That's right. And of course, that narrative of uh, talking about how, how uh, Brexit was xenophobic and racist, they didn't buy that either. You know, I talked about how the Labor Party was divided, uh, for the membership uh, from the, um, uh, the voters from the, the leadership, and how the Tories were divided. But the media in Britain was all together on that racist, xenophobe narrative. The people can get their information outside of mainstream media now. And the truth will out on this, and it did in uh, the Brexit. The New World Order is getting its butt kicked at high noon. Thankfully, the highly suspicious demise of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia has, for the time being, not been a factor in the Supreme Court's decision on Obama's dangerously lawless immigration policy as Obama pushes the country to the brink of anarchy. Of course, it didn't take long for the Obama administration to thumb its nose at the deadlocked judicial branch and the will of the American people. Deferred action policy that has been in place for the last four years is not affected by this rule. Enforcement priorities developed by my administration are not affected by this ruling. This means that the people who might have benefited from the expanded deferred action policies long-term uh, residents, raising children who are Americans or legal residents, they will remain low priorities for enforcement. But like a castle made of sand, the fragile globalist secret world government has been dealt a strong blow by the waves of consciousness inevitably finding a way to the shore of a free world. Adon Salazar writes, Nigel Farage, the leader of the UK's Independence Party, which played a huge part in mobilizing UK citizens behind the Brexit, speculated the momentum behind the results could usher in a Trump presidency. With the Brexit debacle, Landing in the laps of the self-serving, arrogant Bilderberg scum, a propulsion of liberty is accelerating, and the globalists know it. Brace yourself for planetary turbulence. The New World Order will either go quietly in the night, as they wisely should, or their maniacal desperation to rule the world will result in more false flags and order out of chaos, ultimately winding its way down the path toward a very public downfall. People have been asking, how will the Brexit affect the United States? Will it impact the stock market, the Federal Reserve's interest rate, global diplomatic relations? These questions are all based on a ruinous, stagnant, counterfeit system devouring the sovereignty of nations that must be finally recognized and dismantled. Presidential candidate Donald Trump congratulated the UK for voting to assert its independence from the EU and encouraged the American people in November to also assert their independence from the global elite. You know, I said this was going to happen and I think that it's a great thing and we will see, but I think it's going to be a great thing. And he was you said you'd have right basically, to resign? Basically, they took back their country. That's a great thing. Anyone? Following the British vote to exit the EU, Trump said the election results marked a shift toward more nationalistic tendencies. The Trump campaign said in a statement, Come November, the American people will have the chance to redeclare their independence. Americans will have a chance to vote for trade, immigration, and foreign policies that put our citizens first. They will have the chance to reject today's rule by the global elite and to embrace real change that delivers a government of, by, and for the people. Trump continued, I hope America is watching. It will soon be time to believe in America again. As InfoWars has reported countless times, the idea for the European Union globalist superstate came directly out of discussions held at the secretive Bilderberg Group conference in 1955, at which European politicians considered the necessity to bring German people into a common European market as quickly as possible. The lunacy of the global elite can't survive once their dark secrets are completely exposed. Thomas Jefferson once said, Nothing can stop the man with the right mental attitude from achieving his goal. And nothing on earth can help the man with the wrong mental attitude. John Bound for Infowars.com.
David Knight on this day that Britain has declared its independence through Brexit. Joining us now to talk about the implications are Dr. S is Dr. Steve Pachinik, no stranger to InfoWars listeners, but let me remind you of his qualifications, an MD, a PhD in American psychiatry, a former State Department official, author, publisher, crit critically acclaimed author, uh, along with Tom Clancy of the paperback series. Dr. Steve Pachinik, and you'll find him at stevepachinik.com. Welcome, Dr. Pachinik. Thank you for bringing me on the show, Paul. I, I really wanted to come on the show just to give a little perspective from my point of view and to say to the, our audience, a wonderful audience, and to you and Alex, that this was, this was coming about for quite a long time. First of all, I've been writing about this for about 20 years. In one of the Op Center series, I wrote about the devolution of the EU and the necessity for the EU to devolve into uh, entities, not necessarily nation states. Then in my uh, book one and book two of Steve Talks, I insisted that Brexit be the beginning of the end of the EU. Now, let me explain if I don't think anybody else has explained. The EU was created uh, at the time when I was in France in 88 on a mission, was created between France and Germany as an attempt to stop Germany from coming into power again or allowing it to become a, a, a martial force. This was a total ethereal concept concocted by a few French socialists and sociology, none of which had any bearing on reality. What France was afraid of, and it has always been afraid of, is that France has lost wars since the time of Napoleon Bonaparte, who, by the way, was Corsican. But because of World War I and World War II, France decided that it needed to co-op Germany into a concept called the European market. The whole aspect of it was fallacious. It had one currency, it had no military, no intelligence, no uh, force behind it. It had France not as the central power, but Germany became the central power. And the Frankfurt Bank of Germany was actually the most powerful element in all of the EU. So for the past 10 to 15 years, as much as France would like to think that they co-opted Germany, Germany, in fact, became the dominant power, paradoxically. As a result, they lent out a lot of money and credits to Spain, Italy, and Portugal, who in turn defaulted on all their loans. So what does this mean for the Alex Jones show and for us in general? For America, Quite frankly, at the bottom line, it's extremely good what happened in EU. The reason for that is that flight capital and certain immigrants will start to come to the United States because in this world of uncertainty and disorder, the one country that maintains its political, economic, and military stability is the Republic of the United States. What, in fact, will happen to the rest of Europe is that nationalism will arise, and eventually we will see Catalonia or Barcelona break away from Spain, which is already a corrupt country, was not really a country itself. It was created by a French uh, king who, in fact, co uh, coagulated the Basque in Valencia and Madrid and the, and the uh, Catalan provinces. That will break up. Part of France will overthrow probably Hollande, the president who's a socialist, because they have a major unemployment problem and they're now in riot mode. The immigration problem that came in from Syria as a result of Putin's uh, punishment to the West for our taking down the Soviet Union has now made it more imperative for the European countries to make sure that they don't have what's called the Shenzhen Agreement. In other words, they will refuse to accept immigrants and they will refuse to accept other Europeans to come through their own country. From our point of view, unfortunately, as a republic, we did not anticipate this on the formal level, although some of us who wrote and were part of the Alex Jones and the Alex Jones Nation and the Infowar Nation, we could see it coming very quickly and actually insisted on it because it had a strong bearing on what we do here in America. And what do I mean? For many reasons, and we've talked about this for over 14 years, the stand down and the false flags that were created by Bush, Cheney, and eventually the Clintons were involved, and now Obama, was really part of not only taking away our guns, but more importantly, 
reinstituting the federal government as a major source of power over the states and the governors. I had warned the federal government repeatedly at, at expense to myself and others, as has Alex and as has many people at the uh, InfoWar Nation, that the federal government can no longer sustain its legitimacy if it continues to produce these false flags like Orlando, Sandy Hook, and the various other elements we were talking about. The president of the United States is not qualified to be the president. Well, that's it for our show tonight. We do encourage you to go to prisonplanet.tv and get yourself a free trial. You can see the nightly news, the special reports, the rants, all right there at prisonplanet.tv. I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again next week.